Okay, I'm Travis. It's nice to be here. Uh, great to be here in, in Tallinn, in Estonia again. This is my second visit. I had a chance to come in the spring of 2018. I loved it here. Actually, as we'll see, I've been uh, collaborating with uh, folks in Estonia, at least one person in Estonia, for a long time. And in fact, Estonia was one of the first countries I learned about as a contributor to open source. And one of the reasons I still work in open source today, because of the wonderful experiences of collaborating with people all over the world in creating software together. Uh, so I've been a user of Python for a long, long time, much before it was really, really popular. Uh, back in the day, it was sort of just a few of us who worked on Python, and people thought we were a little strange, uh, because we should all be learning something else, like Java. Um, fortunately, we uh, stuck with it, and now it's become one of the popular languages of the world. Uh, in large measure, I think, because of the data science applications. Uh, that, and the fact that it has lots of other applications as well, the data science has really, really helped. Particularly, we, we took a look at, at Stack Overflow trends. If you look at Pandas, NumPy, Matplotlib, those have grown pretty significantly and really led to the creation of the growth of Python significantly. And then when you know, Google and Facebook and Microsoft and everybody said, hey, we gotta do AI, then they built their platforms and then the users, all, this, all the technical users said, hey, where's your Python bindings? Because that's what we're all using here is Python. It pushed them to have to make Python bindings and that helped the language take off like a, sky, like a, like a rocket back in 2015, really quite incredibly. So the, we've been, some of my friends and I have been preparing the way for about 20 years for that to happen. And now we're kind of dealing with some of the consequences. Some of them are great, and some of them are, we have some work to do. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, Google search trends, I really like this. Um, and I love other languages. In fact, one of the things I like about Python is it lets me love other languages without being very you know, specific. I only can do one. Uh, but I still do like writing Python most. And so I like it when my friends and colleagues around the world also seem to like Python. I've been using it for a long time. 1997 is when I started using it, but 1998 I started to actually contribute. And this is back before GitHub, back before Git, even SVN, even CVS. We, we shipped tarballs to each other over email and used diff and patch to collaborate. Yeah, it was very slow. Uh, but it was exciting, and then we had web pages that we made by hand. Uh, that looked, I saw somebody put a screenshot of 1995. Yep, that's the way our, my web pages looked back in 1998 when I first started distributing multi-pack, which became SciPy in 2001. So I've been doing this a long time. A lot of people don't realize I started the SciPy project along with several of my friends, and NumPy came later. I'm more known for NumPy because it's a little more popular, but SciPy is where I started and what my first love was. And then I wrote NumPy really to protect SciPy and help create an ecosystem for SciPy to thrive in. Since that time, lots and lots of things have taken off. Uh, started Anaconda in 2012 and there helped contribute to Conda, Numba, Bokeh, Dask, a variety of other open source libraries. I've mostly been doing management and kind of uh, encouragement and code review as opposed to a lot of coding lately. But I still enjoy writing code and still enjoy talking to developers and have, have a lot of ideas about how we can help move the community forward. So I started with SciPy, and actually in Estonia, I always have to show the Estonian flag and show my friend Piaru Peterson, who's here in the audience, who helped actually write SciPy. Yeah, we should give him a round of applause, actually. <laughs> so, this is a fantastic project. It's been around for 20 years. Finally reached 1.0, I think last year. Uh, is in typical slow style. Uh, used by this number, 128,000, is on GitHub. I don't know how many of those are just test, test projects that people uh, use, but definitely a lot of folks. This started as my procrastination project as a grad student, like many other projects started that way in Python. Uh, and then it became SciPy with the help of, of colleagues. Garu was really critical to actually automating most of this. He was, I was there coding by hand extension modules, and I'll show you how you actually build extension modules in C, and that's what I was doing coding by hand extension modules, writing them in C, and linking to Fortran libraries. And Piaro looked at the, all the Fortran available and said, you shouldn't do this manually. As a real computer scientist, he said, I'm gonna write a script to do this. And he did. He wrote something called f to pi that made that whole process much, much easier. Amazing tool. That led for me, eventually, to writing NumPy. As the uh, fledgling array community, SciPy was built with Numeric, and then NumArray was another array that started to emerge. And basically, there was this divergence in the community early on. Two different array objects competing for attention. And it's okay to have different array objects, but they weren't talking. Memories wasn't shared. 
Um, you'd have, then more importantly, libraries that would be starting to build. You'd have ordinary differential equation solvers and integration solvers and all kinds of things on top of numeric. You'd have other things on top of memory. Eventually, it was just going to split this community. We see another thing happening like that again uh, with all the pipe torches and the tensor flows. And there's actually a many, many more ray objects than there were back in the day. So um, it's, a, it's of a concern. I have, we have some projects trying to deal with that, but that's not for this talk. Uh, nevertheless, I, I left, uh, I was an academic before that happened, and I spent more time writing software than papers, and so ended up um, having to leave the academic post. Uh, but NumPy was born, and I was very happy that it was born, and it's become a very successful project and helped a lot of people, mostly because of the impact of all the people who have joined the NumPy community since the first releases. Now, the next projects I've had only a, a, I mean a user and a, and a colleague and a friend to, but a not direct uh, contributor. Uh, but they're important because they help amplify the growth. Pandas, incredibly important library. How many, uh, how many NumPy users do we have in the audience, by the way? Just raise a bit. Oh, awesome, okay. Those of you who aren't raising your hand, we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, what about Pandas users? How many Pandas users? Excellent, so what, what's Pandas, uh, it surprised me a little bit just how many people are allowed to come into the Python community. PyData was born when Pandas kind of emerged and a lot of people started to come in. People that normally, they wouldn't necessarily see themselves as array programmers, but they could easily use Pandas to do group buys and joinings and database-like uh, syntax. Instead of writing SQL, you could write Pandas Python. Uh, this was created by Wes McKinney. While he was employed by AQR, and it's an important lesson because Every other hedge fund at the time was also writing a data, data frame like library. There are many of them. And as I've worked and, and talked to many of those investment banks and funds, they all had one. AQR um, let Wes open source his. Now, they, Wes just kind of bugged them bad enough, and they said, okay, fine, it's, it's not our big important thing anyway, go ahead and open source it. So that's the one that was open sourced, and that's the one we're all using today. And meanwhile, all the other banks have now had pandas come into their and into their code base and have to figure out how to refactor their code because they didn't open source their code. So it's kind of important, it's a good lesson. If, you're, if you have a, it can be more valuable to you to actually open source something that becomes a standard than to protect code that you think is important that, that isn't to your bottom line. Um, so that happened in 2008. Scikit-learn, uh, probably Scikit-learn users here, raise your hand, got a few. Yeah, Scikit-learn is actually the reason Python's used for, for uh, machine learning and AI. Uh, without a doubt. Scikit-learn is a phenomenal community. It was actually started by a David Cornico, a friend of mine, kind of as a summer of code project. It was interesting, you just, oh, I'm gonna hack together this machine learning library on top of SciPy, on top of NumPy. So he did it, kind of a few functions, but he just excited a bunch of people. It was really one of the very first uh, academic libraries outside of SciPy. When we started SciPy, we thought, oh, here's this, SciPy will be the source of all these libraries, and we'll have SciPy.learn. You know, why is scikit-learn not in scipy.learn? Well, early on, we realized that it's actually really, really hard to coordinate that many developers. At some point, a project gets too big. There's too many people, too many cooks, too many people around the, around the, around the fire trying to make decisions. You can't really do that. And scipy had gotten to that, that point where it was too many projects, too many people. So it really kind of was a math, it was a distribution of Python masquerading as a library. That's how come eventually I got into the distribution game with Anaconda and build a company around how to distribute lots of packages to people quickly. It's kind of interesting to hear, well, how, how did this scientist who studied MRI and ultrasound end up running a distribution company like Anaconda? Um, that's kind of the, basically the, the, the nugget of, of truth. But Scikit-Learn was the first, but it became really popular rapidly as a lot of people gathered, and it was organized in a way that was modular, people could add their algorithms, and there's many, many contributors now across the world, although a, a kernel of users in, in RIA and at NYU who keep it going, uh, used by many. Theano, not as used often, but it was the one that inspired the deep learning frameworks. This is one of the first deep learning frameworks in Python. Now there's TensorFlow and PyTorch and Chainer and, and MXNet and on and on. But this is one of the first. Uh, very, very happy it, it was created. One thing, all of this, all of these modules were different extensions. The reason they existed, the reason Python was used, the reason I got into Python was because people could extend it. They could take their C code, they could take their Fortran code, they could take their, and, and quickly bind it and use Python as a scripting layer. And that extensibility of Python is the reason it grew up. And then when you had useful libraries that were built by people in the industry, people who had domain expertise, 
they knew kind of what they were looking for. Then you have this explosion of libraries around it. Now today, uh, and this is just a small sampling, really many, many industries, many, many domains have specialized libraries for them. And so it's a reason why for many newcomers, Python is like the obvious choice because you just have to import something and you get powerful libraries and powerful capability really, really quickly. Uh, so it can be a, um, I, there's so many libraries right now in Python that none of us are gonna know them all. And we could spend years going to conferences like this and teaching each other about interesting libraries. And isn't that fun? Uh, I think we'll enjoy that. At the very top layer, of course, the machine learning libraries are there. I talk about that in other, in other talks. So I'm gonna talk about kind of why I think Python's had this success and uh, how extending Python has changed from the time I first started and where I think it should go next, because I think we're at a crossroads. I think we're at an important juncture in the history of Python, which is exciting if you're somebody who likes to change the world, because you can still, uh, but it's also a little daunting because there's a lot to do. So why is Python successful? There's much written about this, many opinions, and these are just sort of four of the things I think are key to why Python's used so much. One, the modular extensibility. Easy to make new types and functions. So that's the, kind of the same story, but uh, one is the modules and packages, one's types and functions. Protocol overloading. The fact that you could actually create an object and overload the add operator. Critical for why, why I'm using Python. If I had to write dot add, like Java people have to do, to write to add arrays, I would not be using that language. I'd probably still be using Yorick or something like that. Um, so protocol overloading is pretty critical. In fact, I've looked at Lua, I've looked at other languages, um, JavaScript even, looked at Node, no protocol overloading. So it really makes math equations and kind of the, what a, what a domain expert, like uh, scientists who I know and where I came from, just aren't comfortable having to write all that syntax to just express a math formula. Uh, even Python's a little bit hard, uh, not as easy as some of the other languages, but it's just good enough that with the protocol overloading, you can actually make a lot of things make sense. And then interoperability, ability to connect to multiple languages. So just a couple of examples. I mean, most of you, this is very, very familiar. Modules and packages. Now, I started using Python before packages existed. So to me, packages were innovation. And packages are simply directories with an init, so you can actually then extend them. And SciPy has many, many subdirectories of inits. And you can tell whether you're a module or a package. They're both modules. The packages have this special property that their file is an init.py, just dunder init.py, and the name of the package is the directory name. Whereas a typical, a simple module is the name of the file is a .so or a .pyd, depending on the platform you're on or a .py if it's all in Python. And then all the names are there. It's an easy way for you, modules let you do, or um, create namespaces for all of your types, your classes, your variables, your functions, keep things organized. It's much nicer than, uh, one of the things that I really don't like about Java is that it forces everybody to make objects. You have to, you have to make classes from day one. And beginning students really have no business making classes. Uh, because they shouldn't be making abstractions. What you should be doing is just stitching together other people's abstractions in simple, imperative code. Making abstractions is a beautiful thing, an important thing, but something you have to think about if you're gonna get reusable abstractions that other people want to use. So I don't like the fact that Java forces you to make, make objects from day one. Now, you can get around it by making sort of static, ob static methods and kind of module-like objects. Python has a module object, and so you can just stick functions in there, and as a new user, you can just start writing functions and we're using the, the built-in uh, objects and get a long way before you have to think about making your own extension, making your own classes. And that's a really important property of a language. You can make new types and functions. It, you can make a class in Python. You don't have to, but you can if you need to. And new classes are very important when you want to create another abstraction and contain a lot of data. If you find you're having functions with lots of variables passed along, you have, you have concepts that are all together and they're kind of hanging in a bunch of functions that are together, and maybe you can organize those into a class, especially if you and your colleagues feel like that's a concept that's shared uh, among, the, among the, the company, among the group, uh, that can be very useful. Uh, abstractions are wonderful, shared abstractions are even better. If you can get kind of a lot of people to believe in your abstraction, that's even better, because now you can be comfortable that you're gonna say, here's an array, people know what you mean. Here's a dictionary, and people know what you mean. Here's a list, and there'll be some basic understanding of what you mean. Uh, new functions, easy to make. Notice there's a difference between a function I make in, in Python syntax, you know, the Kurtosis function I just made here, and then the square root function from math. 
Right. Many of you have, uh, anybody built uh, a built-in function? Anybody had to build one of those in C? Everyone done one of that? Raise your hand if you built a C extension and had a and created a built-in function like that. No? Okay. PRO, I know you have, so you definitely should raise your hand. <laughs> there are a few people that I know other, otherwise have had. Uh, there's a difference, right? You could, if you just write a function in Python, you get this function object. If you write, then there's these square roots and sums, which are these built-in functions or methods. How do I make one of those? Well, that's what we're going to show you. You've been, always been able to make one of those. Uh, Python makes them, and you can too. You just have to use a different mechanism than write Python syntax. Uh, but, it's, but it's available, and that availability means Python has been extensible at a fundamental level from the very beginning. So anybody can come along and create whatever they want and add it to language in a robust first-class way. And that's a really powerful thing um, that's, uh, that's made Python very popular in a lot of domains. Of course, particle overloading, these aren't all the Dunder methods. Uh, who's heard the word Dunder before? Raise your hand. Okay, Dunder means double underscore. Uh, I think several people in, have, have made it popular. I, it's very easy to say rather than underscore, underscore, add, underscore, underscore, to say dunder add. Right? So it's kind of a, a simple communication mechanism in English to just describe all of these special methods that if you define them, you're changing the, the way that your objects interact with Python syntax. So you have the ability to overload the way indexing works, the way uh, uh, contexts work the way slicing works, the way pickling works, the way uh, addition works. Uh, all these operators can be overloaded. That's really powerful, and it gives you kind of some, yeah, you can abuse this. There's been some interesting use cases where you can basically bytecode hacks, you can interact, you can do some amazing things if you're clever, um, but you can just do some really normal, useful things as well. So finally, interoperability. This is my opinionated list. There's actually literally um, dozens, hundreds, actually, ways to extend Python using various languages. Uh, this is, these are the ones that I'm familiar with that I recommend. Uh, so C, C++, uh, Cython, Numba, CFFI, C types, Boost Python, Pine, PyBind 11. Uh, very popular, very useful, uh, definitely something to look at. Any Fortran users in the audience? PR, you and I? Yeah? Fortran's still a pretty powerful language. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, Fortran, isn't that dead? Well, not, not in among the scientists it's not. You'll take their fortune out of their cold, dead hands. Or until you give them something that's performance and is easy to write. Now, Fortran in small doses is actually fine. Where Fortran gets dangerous is when it's trying to make main programs in Fortran. You try to build data structures and crazy, um, all kinds of, async I.O. in Fortran? No thank you. Uh, <laughs> array computing in Fortran? Definitely. It's a lot easier, in fact. It's a lot easier than some other languages. Uh, but with f to pi, it's super simple to take Fortran code, Fortran 90, Fortran 77, and link it with Python. That's been around for 10 years, 15 years now. It's been a long time. And it's, it's still popular, uh, a tool from Piaru. Uh, Rust is emerging. I actually think Rust is interesting. I know there was a talk on it this morning. Uh, Rust is starting to be a very useful way to extend Python. It's still early, still new, but Rust, Python, PyO3, I'd probably look at it. If I, instead of reaching for C or C++, I'd probably reach for, uh, for Rust right now and see if I could build an extension using Rust. Um, C Sharp.net and Java, not, I wouldn't go and reach for those languages if I had to write an extension to Python, but they exist and there are tools in those languages, so I might want to reuse those code, those tools. And for that, I actually recommend Python for .NET, Python .NET. It embeds the, the .NET runtime and then calls it from Python. And there's a similar tool, Py4j, JPy, Java Bridge, they all three do similar things, embed a, Py, a JVM, and then call that from Python, and uh, allow you to mirror objects between them. So lots of interoperability uh, tools that make Python easier to get your job done. So that's pretty cool. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about how we uh, extended Python in the past, and go over, so I thought about how to do this. You know, should I show SciPy, should I show NumPy, should I show all the pain I've, I, I used to go through. Uh, really what I got good at was extending Python in C. Like that was probably my number one skill and probably one of the best people at doing that actually because most people don't do that anymore, thankfully. Uh, so, but I, I, uh, I started to do it early on. And in fact, it was actually cut and paste programming that taught me. I was a C programmer, I knew how to write C. Not a superior C programmer, a capable C programmer, not fantastic, but capable. And there was a gentleman, Michael Miller, who just released his package table.io on the net, 
and this is in April of 1998, and I remember I, I saw it, I could look at it, I could read it, I could download it, I could see what he did. And then I remember an essay in May 1998 that Guido wrote of explaining a very critical thing you have to know about when you're writing C extensions in Python, for Python, you have to know reference counting. Um, Python, the C Python runtime, is um, all the objects are reference counted. So it knows when it can deallocate. Every time you, you grab one, you get a reference. If you're just using an interpreter, it handles all that for you. If you write a C extension and you're writing C code, you have to handle that. So if you're making a new Python object, you have to know that it makes a reference. When you're done with it, you have to dereference it, or you're going to create, you're going to create um, memory errors. Um, you're going to create a lot of um, challenges. So he wrote that. I, illustrate, I point this out because it illustrates documentation gets users. The fact that Guido wrote this meant NumPy exists. Right? It's, hard, I mean, it's, very, it's in a very real way. He wrote an essay on how to do reference counting. So I know as a developer it's hard to do documentation. It's hard to kind of put the effort into actually documenting what you wrote and what you did. But it's very important because developers don't use undocumented code. Um, and uh, when I wrote NumPy, probably the single best thing I did was also write a book called Guide to NumPy. It just kind of went through in detail all of how NumPy works. And it did many things. It, it, all, it uh, made me do documentation-driven development. So I had to make sure the code did what the documentation said it did. And then it also just put it out there so people could just read that documentation and know how NumPy worked, as opposed to trying to figure out from the code or something else. So it's very important to document your code. The other thing is to share your work. If you share your work, I mean, Michael doesn't realize how the impact he had, didn't realize the impact he would have. But he did, because he shared his work. And I could see it, and I could cut and paste it. So share your work, document your code. It makes a huge difference in the world. That led to my very, very first uh, contribution called NumPy.io, which is an extension module in C. So I'm going to go through how you do that, and how we did that in the past. And I use not NumPy.io. I actually don't know where that code is. I might have to, <laughs> to do some searching. But there's a really good library from a friend of mine, Elon Schnell. He was the one that uh, built all the first versions of Anaconda. Uh, I've worked with him for a long time. Uh, he's very, uh, uh, he's a German, German engineer, likes things to be uh, handwritten. Uh, he would not be one to use some of the later tools. He likes to write things raw. But he wrote basically something called bit array, which gives you very efficient arrays of booleans. So if you have an array of falses and trues, it'll compress that into bits. And, uh, and just store it in bits in, in, a, in a big vector. And he, so it's, it's accessible from Python. He wrote this library. It's an extension, an extension, a new type in Python that he created in C. So I'm going to show you that code, basically, and how it's done. Um, so you can see it, basically, you can add falses and trues. You can change, you can do slicing. You can uh, create new arrays. There's an encode decode that's actually probably pretty interesting if you ever do Huffman encoding or any kind of encoding where you have to take characters and, and exchange bits with them. So BitArray is actually a pretty useful library for many of you. How does this, how, how does this work? So let's first look at the Python side. He actually made this a package. So BitArray is actually a directory with a dunder init in it. And the dunder init effectively has this code. I've removed a bunch of doc strings. It basically has this code. So from bitarray.underscore bitarray, so there's this other magical underscore bitarray file, he imports underscore bit array, bit diff, bits two bytes, and underscore sysinfo. So those are four, four things he imports from that other magical module that's sitting somewhere. And then he just makes a class, a Python class, bit array, inheriting from this other thing called dunder bit array, the imported from that magical module. And then just adds a few more methods, adds some uh, dunder, in it, uh, dunder functions to make it raise an error if it tries to if you try to take your bit array and convert it to an integer along or a float. And you can look, and if you look at BitArray, the MRO, uh, the method resolution order, so it's just kind of seeing what kind of class this is, you can see that it inherits from a Dunder BitArray and then from object. So Dunder BitArray is another type that inherits from basic object. And then you can look at this BitArray bits to bytes, and what do you know? It's one of those built-in functions or methods. So bits to bytes is apparently some kind of function written in a compiled language that I don't have a Python source code for. Right, that's what that tells you. And then sysinfo, is another function which returns some numbers. Okay, interesting. Uh, I clearly ran this on a 64-bit uh, machine. So this is what that the basic um, initialization function of that function of that Dunder bit array file. So here we have a Dunder bit array file that we're importing from, and that file is a .so. So it's a compiled function, and inside that function is a very particular C function called 
uh, in Mint, well, it depends on your Pi 3K or Pi 2K. One nice thing about this code, and it's available online, you can look at it in, in Elon Schnell's directory and you can see the full file. But you can look and see that in Python 2, you see it differently than Python 3. So I'm highlighting the Python 3, but Python 2 is there. It's, it's looking for this pi init done underscore than whatever your module name is. So that's how Python loads your .so or your .pyd. The Python runtime will look for that. It'll load that shared object using the standard system shared object loader. And in that binary, it'll look for a particular symbol, something called pi init under whatever your name is. When it finds that symbol, it'll execute that code. And that code needs to do things. It needs to uh, basically initialize the module. And in this case, the module functions are stored in this um, table. And this table is basically a list of strings, C functions, and kind of how I call the C function, meth var args, meth o, meth no args, and then a documentation string. And that's how I define a function in the compiled code, is I build a table like that, and I insert it in the right place when I initialize the module. So that's, anybody can do that. You've, all, you've been able to do that for a long time. You can do it today if you want to build new built-in functions or methods. Uh, an example of a built-in function or method, a very simple one, is that sysinfo. So the sysinfo C function, and I know everybody here may not read C, but if you kind of look at it, you can kind of get a feel for what it does if you ignore some of the curly braces. Um, it returns a, an object. <laughs> Everything in, in uh, going to Python land returns a pi object, a pointer to a Python object. And then it has this function, pi build value. Okay, I guess if you saw before, I returned this tuple of five numbers. This is telling me how I create that tuple of five numbers. I, 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 L. So integer, 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 long integer. And I get that, well, I just return number eight, the size of, size of, size of, it's a bunch of size ofs. So that, that, that function just executes when it compiles, it tells me what the size of on the, the compiler on that platform was. Now there's a different mechanism for adding modules in Python 2. And then importantly, at the very bottom of this file, you see this, something happens here, I have a bit array type. I've made a new class, bit array. And that's a new, that's what this dunder bit array here is. So it's not one of those modules, it's a, it's a bit array class. You can see I have three names here, bit diff, bits device, and sysinfo. Those are imported as functions. And I import this other thing, dunder bit array, which is added as a type. So that's a new class I've just made. So instead of writing class bit array in C, I had to do something else to add this new type. And then I add it to the module using that C API. So that's how you build an extension, an extension module, a module that's written in C. In, uh, with a .so or a .pyd, and if you look in your Python directory, you'll see, wherever it is, you'll see a bunch of modules that are actually written as .so's or .pyd's from a platform you're on. They're binaries. They're just symbols in there. Those symbols were compiled from a language, could be compiled from any language, but usually it's C, and they're produced, producing those symbols that do these specific things at a low level. So a lot harder to write this, right? I mean, it's not quite as fun as the command line type in Python. You're doing a lot of Okay, you write this code a particular way, I missed a bracket, missed a semicolon, missed something, have to compile a uh, whole compile step. So building this tool is not that easy. Using it, however, is very easy in Python. So another example of a C function, this one here, sys, uh, sysinfo had no arg, had, Z, had no args, meth no args. On the next page I show bits to bytes which has one argument, meth zero. And you can see that it has it, it takes, instead of no arguments in the bits to bytes parameter, it takes a pi object self, doesn't really use that, that's kind of, that's used later, it's just a, it's a standard uh, function definition, but the pi object v is the argument passed to bits to bytes. Then you can see that it's C code. Now you may not read that C code, but you can kind of basically tell, okay, it's checking on whether that object is an index thing, if it's not, then it raises an error, and returns null. That's how Python returns errors. That's how the C function returns errors. It returns null as the a zero, basically, as the pointer. And then the wrapper that's calling this checks. Hey, is there, an, a, a, is there an error? Great, then I'll go to the error handling if there's not. Is it, so error handling is a thing you've got to manage in the C level. It's, it's particularly, um, not necessarily particularly nice. It's, it's somewhat tedious. Um, and then you return a Python object. Now, if you make a mistake here and I return uh, a Python object pointer that's not a correct one, then I'm going to return to the runtime a pointer to some place it shouldn't be re dereferencing, and I'll get a psych fault. Like, it's very easy to shoot your, shoot your foot off, as Dave Beasley used to say when I was younger. 
he'd have all kinds of, he'd love to write extension modules, he'd have all kinds of to toys and tools, and he just, you can kind of blow up your interpreter pretty easily, um, because it's, the power is in your hands. But that's what you're doing when you're extending Python the old way, the way we did back when we were children, when I was a kid. Uh, the, the type, is it, the uh, class itself is kind of interesting. Every single built-in type, an int, a dict, a list, an numpy array, here a case a bit array, effectively has a table like this. This is a virtual function table. Basically a table that lists the function pointers to call whenever Python encounters some aspect of its syntax. Something like a, it occurs an add or it's a slice or something. And it goes into this table and it calls the pointer that's sitting at one of these tables. Now in a lot of cases it's zero, there's nothing there, so therefore Python won't do anything. If it finds there's a null there, okay, don't know what to do in this case. So you can see there's the name of it. This is where the bit array, under bit arrays, so that's the name of this class. There's a size of a thing. What is that thing? It's the size of a bit array object. That bit array object is where the actual data for the object is stored. This is the function pointer table. It's like all the methods that are called. Then there's a pointer, then there's the structure itself. So I'm not gonna go into detail. All this is documented on the web pages. You can go into detail to your heart's content uh, what all of these mean. And if you want to build a capable type, you have to fill in all these functions, which can take a little while and be tedious. Uh, I'll, I'll point out the bit array methods. That's actually all the other methods, not the dunder methods, but the other ones you want to, you, that you just want to be able to call. If you look at the bit array methods, it has a lot of them, all, any, append, and it's very similar to that other methods table we showed you before. How do you build met module methods? Similar thing. You have the name, you have the function to call, then you have, how do I call this? What kind of arguments? No args, no args, metho. Here I'm seeing uh, var args. With a var args function, I have to use a pi arg parse tuple. I, what I'm giving is a tuple of arguments. Then I have to parse the tuple in order to get out the actual arguments from the tuple. So that's how Python actually handles multi-arguments. Multi multiple arguments get passed around as a tuple object. The very core of Python tuples are everywhere. And then if you want to return more than one variable, it's a tuple you're actually returning. So it's a very handy um, way to kind of take that concept. That's why tuples exist, basically, because they're built in the language at a very core level. So that's the bit rate. That's how you build, a, that's how you build your, your new class in C code. Again, a lot harder than doing it in Python, but now you're able to write C functions and take advantage of compiled code. You can do that, as, it can be as fast as you want. People say Python is slow. You can build something in Python that is not slow. NumPy is not slow, and you can, because it's built like this. You can easily build something that's not slow in Python. You can do, and you can also do things like release the GIL. In the C API, when you write C extensions, you don't have to have a GIL. You have it by default, but you can get rid of it and release it if you're calling a section of code that doesn't use the Python runtime. Mostly, that's not doing reference counting. That's when you know you can release the GIL if you don't have to do any reference counting. You don't have to, you don't have to access the C API. Um, this is the bit array object. It's basically the thing that stores the data for your object. So in this case, it's storing the, the pointer to all the bits that are in the bit array. Some extra information like how much is allocated. There's this, every single Python object has this pi object base, pi bar object base in this case, which has a reference count and a pointer to the type object table. That's a pi object. Everything in Python's a pi object, and what it is, it has a reference count, and then it has a pointer to this big structure of function pointers that tell it how to behave in certain scenarios. And that's the Python type system. And then these var objects also have op size, things like lists, things like strings, they'll have that size also built into the var object. And bit array has one as well. So there you go, that's how you extend Python, that's how we used to do it in the past. We'd write, you can still do it today, bit array, bit array still exists, you can still write code like this today. It's very powerful. Uh, you, have, you have access to all the machinery of Python itself. All of Python's objects were built this way. Everything in there. So you can, you can go in and look at the Python code base and look at the dict object, look at the list object, look at the string object. It's all written just like that. Uh, and there's this huge C API that implements everything you need. Uh, you're literally extending Python with, the new, with new built-in types and functions as if it came with Python itself. It's incredible speed, as fast as the machine can work. Downsides, and there are some. Reference counting. <laughs> You have to do it manually, and you'll make mistakes, many of them, uh, until you get really good at it. And even then you'll make mistakes. Um, error handling, it can be tedious to handle errors. 
You're constantly checking for different returns, making sure the return's not null. If it is, propagating errors. It can be difficult to keep track of where your errors are, and therefore, when people call it, it can also be difficult for, to give really good error messages. And then changing those error messages means you're recompiling code, because those error messages are built as static strings in your binary. And so there's a lot of, you know, error handling can be a lot longer. Initialization, you have to make sure to initialize everything. A lot of bug, bugs come because people just, oh, I'm gonna assign this to a new type, forgetting to initialize the bottom of the, of the uh, structure. So now it's just random bits instead of a zero, for example. Those random bits, later on, the runtime says, oh, I'm gonna point to that place and do whatever it says, or jump to that part of the code that says. Seg fault. So you have to make sure initialization is taken care of. Um, then the big problem that's emerging is now other runtimes, PyPy, Rust Python, they can't use your tool. You know, your tool is built to work with the C Python runtime. Uh, and that's it. And that's, uh, so those are kind of down, you know, big downsides. Uh, so we'll keep that in mind. So today, what do you do? How do we extend Python today? Okay, this is my opinionated view. If I were to start over today with what exists, um, first I would just write my code in Python unless I absolutely need more speed and just use existing extensions. There's so much out there. It's probably rare you need to write one, actually. And if you think you do, do some more Google searching or ask a friend or ask on the internet. There's probably something out there that does what you want to do faster than you could think you could do it. All right, now if you really do need something, you, you might, depending on what you're using. If more speed is needed, use Numba. Numba's a fantastic tool. Who's you, who knows Numba? Raise your hand if you've heard of Numba. Really? All you guys are scared to, show, to admit you don't know it? <laughs> Okay, that, yeah, definitely find out about Numba. It's a powerful tool. You can actually write fat code as fast as C++ and C just by using Python syntax. So it's a very powerful tool. I would also use Cython. Uh, if Numba doesn't fit the bill, and Numba wouldn't cover, cover error every case, then I would use Cython. Who's used Cython? A few more, okay. Well, um, definitely another tool to look at because Cython is a very easy way to write Python-like syntax. And then what I'm hoping will become more and more useful is my, MyPy. It's still, MyPy, who's used MyPy? I've heard a few of folks. I saw it earlier today, people putting type annotations. MyPy started as a type annotation tool. Then the folks at Dropbox have built something called MyPy C, which actually takes your type annotated Python and creates a compiled extension. So it's kind of doing Cython-like things. It's, not, it's definitely not as mature as Cython. Cython's a very mature tool. Can use, it can be used and is used today with, with production all over the place. MyPy C is still experimental, but I'm hopeful that it'll actually become a very very useful and powerful way to work. It's, it is working today, they use it to, to make MyPy. So if you pip install MyPy, MyPy YC, you're getting a MyPy C compiled version of MyPy on your, on your uh, so it is used today. Now, a few people, and I, you know, I do recommend running with PyPy, PYPY, that's the Python, written in Python, JIT compiled, it's a cool project. Um, and I'd probably take a look at Rust too, but those are kind of secondary. And especially if I'm not using any existing extensions, I'm just kind of exploring. So that's my opinion of you about what you should use today, what I would be using. I would not have written all that I did if Numba had existed. A lot of what, I, what, what SciPy and NumPy are would have actually just been written with Numba. And we'd all be happier. Uh, so what is Numba? I'm going to briefly go over Numba here. It's a JIT compiler for Python. So it's it's not really just in time, it's more of a ahead of time compiler, but we use the word JIT because it's more familiar. It's open source, it compiles functions at a time. So you decorate your function and it magically replaces your Python function with a, C, with a native runtime and a Python interface to it. And all by just putting a decorator. Very simple to use. It's actually a toolbox that lets you create things for single-threaded situations or multi-threaded. It also can write code for the GPU. It's still the fastest way to program the GPU that I know of. It's very easy to write a function that can take advantage of all the cores on your GPU. Uh, it's a subset of Python what it allows, so it's not all of Python that it speeds up. But it can get significant speed ups, even compared to NumPy, 2x compared to NumPy, even 200x or 1000x if you start adding the GPU capability. So it combines the ease of writing Python with speeds approaching Fortran or C. So it, um, it's 100% open source, it comes with a CUDA simulator. Anybody want to learn how to program CUDA? Anybody heard of GPUs and programming CUDA? Numba actually comes with a CUDA simulator. So you can actually simulate your CUDA code in Python and then debug it, and then you can run it, of course, at, at slower speeds in Python, but then you can run it at massive speeds on the GPUs. Um, here's how, how does it work. 
Basically, we recognize, with, we use LLVM. LLVM is the same backend that C++, Clang uses, and other compiled Swift uses, other languages use, and it makes Python just another set of ASCII characters that produces machine code. So there's nothing magical. We just need type information. Like we can't, in order to compile and specialize, we've got to have type information. And so how does that work? We don't have type information when we first define a Python function because it's basically a template. So it creates kind of a shadow, um, it analyzes the function arguments and, does, and has some IR of the, uh, of the bytecode and creates this place. Now once you call the function, now you call it with real arguments, those arguments are typed. Uh, Python is dynamically typed, but strongly typed. Everything has a type. When you call it with those types, then it can specialize. It says, oh, do I have a specialization for these arguments? No, make one. I can do type inference on the rest of the function, rewrite the IR with types included, lower it down to LVM, and JIT that to machine code, and then store that away. And so it's uh, actually quite magical. Uh, when you start using it, you're just sort of, whoa, the power of the machine is, is the same power you feel writing C code, you now feel writing Numba, although it's much simpler and uh, higher level. Uh, it's on mobile hardware, mobile platform, mobile OS's. Basic example, so there is the at JIT by itself, currently by default, it will, um, It'll try to complete. So if it, if it can lower things, it'll lower it. If it can't, it'll keep it in Python runtime mode. Um, we, I usually recommend to people that people either use the no Python equals true or there's another decorator called ngit, and just use that if you're first time to use Numba because what that'll do is actually it'll raise an error if it can't analyze your bytecode and lower everything. Uh, that's sometimes easier than kind of scratching your head wondering why is this not faster when it, it, there's some element of your code that it couldn't understand or couldn't lower the types for. So this is kind of, this is NumPy-like code, but you can write this code and then lower it, and when you run it, it's basically uh, four, three times faster, a little bit, 2.5 times faster than the NumPy equivalent, even. So pretty simple to write that code, and you get fast uh, results. Um, so you can use NumPy, you can use the, notice the for loop. I'm looping over an ND array with for element in using Python syntax, that's pretty cool. Uh, that's a lot of fun. I'm using, I'm using uh, in-place uh, indexing, I'm using uh, the, the slice notation, and that, and that all works. So it detects your CPU model during compilation and optimizes for that target. So it's actually a handy way, you can, basically if, you're, if the person has Numba installed, if you have Python plus Numba, that becomes a really powerful runtime for you now. Because you can hand text code to people. You just hand them a text file and then they'll get optimized code out on, on the back end. So that same uh, cycle you're used to, iterative cycle with Python you're used to, is now available with this really fast runtime capability. It dispatches to multiple type specializations, so if you call the same function with different types, it'll lower that to a different subtype and have, a di have the dispatches all built in. Uh, the compiler itself is also extensible. Currently it supports all of NumPy, most of NumPy. You can, you can extend that to even more. Um, there's some nifty features. It'll take advantage of SIMD instructions. There's even a parallel. You can release the gil. Uh, no gil equals true means that this function will not keep hold of the gil, so you can run inside of a thread, and another thread can run. Um, very handy. So you can use things like Python concurrent futures in order to spawn off a bunch of um, low-level native functions that are written in Numba. Um, we're going to skip this one for a short of time, uh, but you can do things like target equals parallel and you can target a, a function, you can basically run a function across a huge array with all of your cores, just by saying target equals parallel. Change that to target equals CUDA, and now you're running on an NVIDIA GPU, or change it to target equals AMD rock M, rock M, and you're targeting AMD um, experimentally, but nonetheless, you have that capability too. So all of a sudden, Python is now like OpenCL. It's a cross-language way to write accelerated code. Intel's helped with some basically taking, analyzing NumPy expressions and producing parallel code from those NumPy expressions. Uh, very handy. And there's a P range, which is similar to OpenMP's uh, ability to loop over in a range and, and parallelize the body of that for loop. Okay, Cython. I'm gonna quickly go over Cython. Cython, here's a couple of references, a book by Kurt Smith, a good friend. Uh, his his uh, Sci-Fi tutorial on Cython is excellent. Many of the things are, are borrowed from there. This is just basic use, giving you an idea of it. So, Cython is, you make a, a modification, you make a, a, a superset of Python, typically with a PYX extension, 
You can just write Python code and Cython will work on Python code. What it does, it takes your Python code and translates it to C API. Gets rid of the interpreter basically and just translates all these object calls. It does the same thing as your code would have done. Now that's not, it gives you maybe a one and a half to two X speed up right away, but the real power comes when you start to do C level kinds of functions inside. There's a setup.py, they'll Cythonize that code into a C extension and then build it. Um, if you're using a notebook, there's a Cython magic and Lodex you can run. Uh, so that's basically how you use it. You have to translate the PYX to something. So there's still a build, a compile loop. It's not quite as simple. But if you look at the PYX file, it looks a lot like Python, except these CDEFs everywhere. CDEF is where you define the type of variables. So once you define the types, then it can know what to do. Um, there's, if you're using C++, you can actually use some of the C++ standard library. It's available. You can define libraries like that. It'll use that then and translate that to a C++ file and import the standard library to use it. So some people really like Cython for extending and uh, embedding C++. You can create an extension type. So that big long list I showed you for Bitarray, you can just write a class definition in Cython and it does the equivalent. And it gives you all those function pointers without you having to do that work. So it's very easy to build an extension type in Python, like that Bitarray example. And then you can also do things like anything that works with PEP318, which is a buffer protocol, uses memory views, you can describe those with this special syntax. So Cython gives you this power and ability to write very fast code with Python-looking code. It's not, it's, it's a change in the language. It's Cython, the, it's strictly a superset of the language. MyPy at MyPyC, very experimental, this is effectively, you can think of it like a Cython, but using type annotations. Uh, Cython happened before type annotations existed. So you, know, you ask, well, why do you use the CDEF here? Why not use something else? Well, there was nothing else. So they created something. And uh, my, now that type annotations are a thing, MyPy lets you take and add typing information to a file with, with uh, comments, if there's not an obvious place to put it, or with uh, the type uh, annotations of Python 3. So you can tell what the inputs are, what the outputs are going to be, and then you can write code that, that tells you what the types are going to be. And MyPy is generally used for linting, for just looking at the code and making sure it's what you want it to be. But uh, it can be used to make it faster, and that's what MyPy, that MyPy C is. All right, so that's what people do today, or what I recommend you should do today. What about in the future? Where should we be going? Only have a lot, of, only have a little bit of time, which is good because I can't predict the future, and I only have a little bit to say about it. <laughs> So this is all intentional. Uh, today we have this massive community of libraries that are really cool for doing data science, for doing deep learning, for doing anything you care about. But if you're a PyPy, Iron Python, Jython, MicroPython, Rust Python, there's all these extensions, all these new runtimes in Python, they all can't use it. PyPy has been a wonderful project, struggled to use any of this stuff. And that's been a real drag, actually. More, more than that, a lot of companies are trying to figure out how to make the Python runtime better. And these C extensions are a real drag on that ecosystem. Like you can't change the Python C API because everything uses it. And so you basically, anything change you want to make, you have to kind of rewrite all the extensions. So it's this massive anchor actually on the Python runtime. So Python C API kind of bad now actually, even though it was good and it helped a lot of things flourish, now that biggest strength is our biggest weakness. And that we, we can't, how do we move forward as a language community with all these extensions? So what do we need? What I want to see, what I'm interested in seeing, what I'm interested in promoting, is a way to extend Python. Let's change extending Python, hide the C API, show people how to write Python in a way that, that targets multiple runtimes by default. So write your extension this way, and when you know you'll get something for Rust Python, PyPy, C Python all at once. And the ability to add new runtimes, so that JavaScript, Botvia, whomever can actually add the runtime, and they'll know the extension modules will come along because they're all written in a particular way. So, and then we need the NumPy community to move to that, to that stack, and then everything else to move to that stack as well. This is, take up, this is a five-year journey. You know, three years to kind of build the thing, and then another two years to get the first wave. This is a Python 3-style initiative that has to be done. But it's an important initiative. It's something I think we absolutely need to do. We've talked to a lot of people in the Python community. They're super excited if we can make this happen. We just have to rally the support. We have to rally funding. We, we actually know the people who do this. I've already talked to the right people, Armin Roger, Armin who wrote PyPy, there's the Cython folks, there's people in the middle. If you're here and you're involved with this, let me know. Talk to the Python core committee. Everyone's excited. We just need money. 
There is early hope. Some of those folks have actually started to look at the C Python and say, how do we fix this? Hey, let's change Pi objects to this HPy, this handle. You know, no problem can't be solved without another layer of indirection. Right, it's kind of a uh, solution in that direction. Um, my proposal is we need to basically look at Cython and, and MyPy and, have the, and put them together and have a baby. We need to have MyPy with type annotation, but a tool that, it, that is as, as powerful as Cython, but with MyPy syntax. And basically a subset and a DSL, an embedded DSL in Python that, can, that is how you extend Python. So borrow heavily from Cython ideas, but I think you have to fork it and make a new parser, partly because the Cython code base is really difficult. To, to change at this point. But I think they've got tremendous ideas and a lot of work, and we should, we should borrow from it as much as possible. Numbers also there to borrow from and to use and to connect with this. The same time, clean up from below. So how? Just $5 million. Uh, I think for $5 million we can get there, and we're working on that. Quonset Labs, a new initiative, we have a concept called Cooperative Community Work Orders, and with 20, 250K commitment from 20 companies, with 25K to start, we can do this. Uh, the people are there, the need is there, the energy is there, we just need to get companies behind it. So it's, at Quonsite, we, we have salespeople, marketing people, we're just rolling out this proposal. And this is what Quonsite does. We take on big proposals, big ideas, and we try to bring them to market. Uh, and try to do it just like we've been doing for a while. So um, that's our approach. I believe we can do this. If you want to get involved, ping me, let me know. I'm excited about this, excited to do it. Uh, open Teams is a way we're going to try to help. Open Teams is about creating initiatives, a new platform for developers. Go to openteams.com, sign up, build your portfolio, show your interest. In fact, if you're interested in doing some of these proposals, just show a sign up on there and ping me, and then let me know and I'll connect you to the effort. All right, that's it. Quonsite Labs is um, where I work. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff I do, I won't go into all that, but if you're interested, come talk to me and we'll talk. Thanks everybody, appreciate the chance to give a talk here. So let's get to the questions. Okay, so the top question. Most of the enterprise softwares are still written in Java. Do you see it changing? Will Python take over? Yes. <laughs> no, um, I, it is changing, but Java's gonna be here to stay. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in Java, so, but there's a lot, everyone using Java is also using Python. So I see a lot of opportunity for good Java Python bindings. I see a lot of big companies have really you know, pretty good, good connectivity. The open source stuff is pretty anemic still. I'd love to see more open source Java Python uh, tools. Mm -hmm. What are your recent successful projects? What are recent Python extensions you see a lot of potential in? Oh, sure. Uh, lots of, unfortunately, I had a chance to be a lot, part of a lot of projects. Um, Dask is huge. If you haven't tried Dask, definitely try Dask. Panel is a big one. Jupyter, Jupyter Lab. Jupyter Lab is a huge project, lots of, lots of momentum. Excited by that. Uh, so uh, that, that whole ecosystem, I think, has a lot of potential. I'm just, then I look over and I see all kinds of amazing things in other realms, too. So come talk to me later, but these are the ones I'm, I'm Panel, si uh, Dask, Numba, Bokeh. Those are ones I was intimately familiar with over the past four years. Others I'm still learning about. Actually, uh, I saw a lot of async I.O. here. I like Trio. Uh, check out Trio if you're into async I.O. I think the way they explain it is really good. Cool. Django, Flask, Pyramid, Tornado, which one would you choose for your next startup project? Uh, depends how, I'd probably start with Flask and uh, mix in, uh, in and Tornado and mix in Django. So I've done all three of those. I haven't used Pyramid so much. I know Pyramid's popular in Europe and nothing against it. I just, in the US, I can't find people who use it very much. So uh, I like, you know, Pyramid seems strong, but I would be using probably Flask, Tornado, Django, personally. Cool. To make Python faster, should I use an extension or should I use Numba? Uh, use an existing extension and then use Numba. Okay. Don't, write an, don't write an extension. <laughs> Great. What Pi framework do you use most often? Oh, I don't even know how to answer that question. What Pi framework? Uh, like, like web framework? Um, I use Conda. How about that? <laughs> I use Conda for package management. I have a very opinionated perspective on how package management should work for, for users. For developers, PIP is pretty good, but not for users, it's not. So, go ahead. Okay. Where does the name Numba come from? Uh, Numba comes from uh, Mamba and uh, NumPy, or numeric. Mamba is a fast name, so yeah, it just kind of came together. 
Okay, if you were looking for great Python developers, is Estonia the best place where you would turn? <laughs> uh, it was the first place I looked for, actually. I found Piaru here. <laughs> um, I like Estonia a lot, but I, it's far away from me. But actually, we do have uh, Piaru is here, and if there's great Python developers, we'd love to bring him. We'd love to hire him here. So yes. Great. Um, if JIT makes everything faster, why isn't it used on all Python functions all the time? It's a good question. It makes everything that in the language it supports faster. Um, it's still a little. You know, there's a lot of code you can write that JIT won't support. Uh, Python's a very big language, and JIT doesn't work for everything. So it's particularly useful for uh, numeric kinds of coding or things that have a, that you're trying to get 10x speed ups on. Um, so async IO yields asynchronous coding. JIT's not going to help you. Sense. Can number do lambdas? Yes. Yes, it can. Okay. I think we've already answered that question. Is pyramid still a good option to choose in 2020? No, not qualified to answer that question. <laughs> okay. Best Python framework for Dask engine. No API functionality. Uh, I really like Dask. Uh, Prefect is built on top of Dask. But I also like Airflow. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you think of Jython? I think Jython's really cool, but it doesn't have the C extensions, so it really is not as useful as it could be. Okay. So. Okay, isn't Python too slow to use with <laughs> GPU? No, it is not. You're not actually using Python on the GPU. You're using Python to orchestrate code on the GPU. Just the same way you use Python to orchestrate uh, scientific libraries. So use Python to build the code, then what runs the GPU is native code. So no, it's not too slow to do that. It's very good, actually, for that. What resources would you advise on how to develop high-quality Python extensions like NumPy, Clean, and Pandas? Um, start small and solve a problem, and then get a community around you. Build, you know, get people excited to help you. Uh, and then, at this point, use tools like Cython and Numba. Don't, don't start from scratch. Okay. We're short on time, but we'll just take this question as well. The typing in MyPy is great, but does not allow things like kinds and other useful typing abstractions. If MyPy is the future, will it be important to add these? Uh, yes. Um, I, my view of on MyPy as the future is in making a DSL for extending Python, which may not need all of those things, uh, but it may need other things. It will need other things. So um, I would say, you know, MyPy is a future for creating extensions. Great. I think right. we'll stop there. That was a great talk and a great Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you.